Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Brandy Parisi. I'm a host and producer with All Classical Portland. And I'm joined tonight by the head horn player since night. So you've been here since 1982, John Cox with Your Oregon Symphony. Thank you. It's good to see all of my old friends out here. Thank you. So, John, this is a little bit last minute that, that John's stepping in. Um, Carlos is getting ready still tonight. Um, but I'm so excited that tonight's the first night I've gotten to, to meet you. I don't know how we've passed each other these 11 years or so, but somehow or another, we just hadn't met. Well, it's exciting for me as well. And 11 years, oh my goodness. <laughs> Whoa. Well, these little things will happen. Right. Better late than never. So this will be exciting. So, this work is incredibly popular, um, but critics, ever since its premiere, have, have disagreed about whether it is a, a requiem, a true requiem, an opera. Hans von Bülow called it an opera in ecclesiastical robes. What's your take on, on the Verdi requiem? It's a great piece of music. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I... I must say, I personally came to this work um, probably about 40 years ago. I was playing it um, uh, when I was still in college, but also a member of the um, Evansville Philharmonic in Evansville, Indiana. And I remember this piece then. And it is just one of those powerful pieces that you can either bother to categorize or not bother to categorize, and it doesn't matter either way. I do think that as far as von Bülow went, well, he had his own... Yes, he did. He had his own agenda. But Verdi wrote this at a time that, um, I'll, I'll say right off, Verdi didn't have to write it for the money. He didn't write it for the money. He was very well set off at this point. He uh, was an extraordinarily successful uh, composer, very much the John Williams of the day. Um, and so he was he was gaining the top dollar period in all of Europe for writing a new opera, and uh, they were all hits as soon as they came out. But he wrote this work, and um, it's, it is true what the critics said about the work. It's very much maybe his best opera he ever wrote, and, and probably because it's the best libretto. <laughs> <laughs> You just can't beat, you can't beat the subject matter. <laughs> well, you bring that up, but the fact is um, Verity was not a devout person, and so there are different places in this Requiem Mass where he emphasizes and de-emphasizes in places that may be a little less traditional than other composers up to that point. I would agree with that. It's, it's, it's very, very different than... Um, frankly, any other Requiem Mass that uh, I've played. And you've got to understand that Requiem Masses were being written, a lot of them in those days. Um, uh, there was the um, Brahms German Requiem. Of course, that was on the, um, with the uh, Lutheran Bible in mind and Lutheran traditions. Um, a few years before had been the Grand um, Berlioz uh, Mass of Death. Uh, about the same time, Durafle wrote a um, uh, Grand Requiem and uh, Foray. Mm -hmm. But this is the big one. This is really the big one. I don't think there was a Requiem Mass written that was this large until the Benjamin Britten Requiem Mass sure. of 1962. So when you're looking for grandeur, really celebrating both death and life, this is the big one. And I think that was very much what, what Verdi was trying to do. Yes, it is the mass of death. It's requiem from um, Latin rest, final rest. But this was also written for the living. Y you can just tell the death don't need the kind of drama that he put in this work. And, you know, you're all laid out there. I'm, I'm assuming I've never seen anybody actually, uh, oh, I've seen a movie or two where they come back to life. We've all seen those. But, um, no, this was, this was very much 
a celebration of life mm -hmm. as well. I think at the time of life when Verdi wrote this, he was, as I said, he was very well off, uh, set very well off. Late middle-aged um, and um, at absolutely the height of his compositional powers. And so what did he do? He brought in all the elements that he knew best from opera. And oh my goodness, did he ever combine them so beautifully. Well, as you said, this is as much about humanist concerns than, than it is about God. Um, he was not a devout person. I'm curious, do you have any thoughts about why he chose to write a requiem and not an oratorio in that case? I can't speak for him. He, uh, I'm, I, I'm not that old and I didn't meet him personally. <laughs> My, my kids would actually beg to differ, I'm sure. But I think this was at a time when there was so much turmoil and change in the world. And uh, an oratorio just didn't have the power, the grandeur. For one thing, you can write an oratorio on the, the great gospels, on the four gospels. Or you can write an oratorio on some high and lofty um, Old Testament setting or Buddhist setting or whatever you want to write one on. But there is something about this. Verdi, by this time, he had been married early and um, his wife had died. He'd lost a child. He'd married again and had... Um, part of a new family. Um, going back all the way to his childhood, he'd come from the absolute bottom of society, poor as Job's turkey, except that the turkey got to eat just before Thanksgiving. And um, Verity didn't. Verity worked very, very, very hard to attain everything he got. His first works, his first attempts, they weren't successes. He had to learn the hard way, and boy did he, and he struggled and struggled. He got better, and it caught on. So I think it's very much a celebration of uh, life of other people. It's a celebration of who he felt he was and his place in society, the grander scheme of man as a greater thing. And I really think that he's celebrating the size of the grandeur of man rather than the glory of God in many ways. Wow. We were talking a little bit before we came out about um, his, his nationalism also. You know, prior to this, he had written for uh, Nabucco, Va Pensiero, which became in many ways the, the anthem of, of a unified Italy. And I, what I hear you saying is that this Requiem, to a certain extent, also had that spirit behind it in celebrating uh, these other two great Italian men. Absolutely. When you look at it sociologically of the times, this was a time of great change. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing and had been for about 50, 60 years. Um, things were changing. Things were being discovered right, left, and sideways. Um, England and France were the two huge superpowers of the world. They were imperialistic. And um, other com countries in Europe wanted to either gain some of that or try to regain some grandeur. Of course, there had been all the countries that had had grandeur before the two of those countries took over. But sociologically, you've got um, Bismarck who is unifying all of the Germanies at this time. Um, and then you've got the three Italies, which are now being unified. And much as the works of Wagner created the new Germanic myth to help unify uh, Germany into one entity, and as really, in many ways, it was, they were Germanic myths of a new age, Verdi did the same thing in his music and then carried on through Puccini as well. But it really was um, Rossini that started things, going through maybe the 
first great revolution in uh, the 19th century being the um, revolution of 1848 in, uh, uh, in um, uh, Europe. And then you have the music of Verdi, which is saying to all of Italy, this is our music, not your music and your music and your music, but we're all Italians and we can get behind this. And it, it did its job. <laughs> Verdi wrote some of the most beautiful and some of the most challenging music, I would argue, of the 19th century for the human voice, but also for, uh, for, for orchestras and for, for uh, instruments. But he saved a lot of it for this Requiem. So let's talk about some of the music. Um, the opening to the Agnus Dei especially, I think, is just breathtaking. It is just beautiful. I remember being about 20 years old I can remember that far back. And my old horn teacher, I was playing third horn in the, in the Evansville Philharmonic. My horn teacher was playing second horn to me. And he used a word that I'd never heard before, and I had to look it up before I knew he wasn't cussing at me. But the word is called magadizing. And it means to sing in octaves. So you've got the beauty of the... Um, um, of the opening of the uh, Requiem. You've got the power, the absolute terror day of wrath in the Dies Irae. You come to the Sanctus, the fourth movement, holy, 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 and you hear that light, joyous melody. Then you come to the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. And I really think that he meant this in, even though he was maybe at best agnostic, he meant for the sacrifices of uh, Christ on the cross, the Lamb of God. And it opens up after just an absolutely stunning closure to the Sanctus with the soprano and the mezzo singing in octaves magadizing for some 14, 15 bars. Now, in the original days for the um, Latin Mass, it was sung to plain chant, Gregorian chant. That was gone. Verdi writes his own plain chant for this movement. The melody of this is his own version of what a plain chant is, and he makes it so simple. It's just the two voices singing as one an octave apart. Absolutely brilliant music. And when you come to it, it's just stunningly breathtaking music. It, it's gripped me ever since the first time I've heard it. And it never fails to grip me exactly the same way. It is a moment to hush, turn inwards, be human. Beautiful, beautiful. As a brass player, I, I have to ask you, I know it's not the horns, it's the trumpets, but like with Aida, which he had just written about a year before he began work on the Requiem, um, Verdi starts to play a little bit with how he uses the concert hall, and specifically with, with brass, brass instruments. And he uses the trumpets kind of in an interesting way in the Requiem as well. Well, he does, and orchestra musicians Brass musicians in general love playing Verdi in the opera because there are what's called stage bands. And um, you get a lot of extra money for appearing on the stage as a stage band. People make tons of it. They make whole livings and careers coming in and playing 20, 30, 40 bars and then disappearing off into the taverns for a couple of hours or the entire next day. Well, he actually uses this, and you're absolutely right, with all of the operatic devices, which is really, this is a staged opera using, as I said earlier, maybe the grandest libretto he could find. He brings in two pairs of offstage trumpets and uh, uses those. It's a very short usage, but it is absolutely thrilling in the uh, Dies Irae where it's the wrath of God again. And you hear the clarion trumpet calls of God from not only starting softly on stage, but from the distance. At best, you would like to hear those trumpets 
from a very far distance, and each time they come in, they're about 30 yards closer. We can't do that, but <laughs> that is the effect, and you will hear the call of God opening up for judgment. Nice. And that, that the, 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 it's amazing. After that beautiful pastoral opening and beginning, and it's so gentle, and then uh, by the second part, you just get your head torn off in the best possible way, I promise. It's lovely. <laughs> but even if you're expecting it, even when you know it's coming, it's like, ah. Uh, Okay, let's get to the last movement, uh, though the last section, because it's not one movement, it's actually a set of four different pieces. The Libra May, which is kind of a juxtaposition moving back and forward from resolution um, and, and this terrifying dies uh, irae from, from the very first or second part of the piece. I think this is one of the things where you're absolutely right. He took a tremendous amount of liberty with the um, with the Catholic Mass at this point, and um, you know it's supposed to end with the um, um, "Deliver me." Well, you don't get deliverance without one more really good hellfire sermon. <laughs> <laughs> So I think he was uh, actually more Southern Baptist at that point than he was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it was done on Wednesday nights or not. I mean, certainly where I grew up. It was, anyway, he does bring this back. And I think this is very much the operatic device that he uses. He brings back the drama. Without this terrifying drama, how can you set up this absolutely draining end. Otherwise, you're, you've got this draining end for 20 minutes, and you need to have the drama. He understood that, and the best thing he could do was say, hey, it's coming back. I'm going <laughs> to scare you one more time. There's the T-Rex, and it's coming. And, uh, you know, and um, then he says, but you're, now you're delivered. And uh, I think it really is for the dramatic effect. Nice. Nice. I had to look down at my note for a moment because I needed, I couldn't remember the name of the, the person for whom this was written. Alessandro Manzoni. Originally, you know, Verdi wrote an, an, or part of another mass for Rossini. We all know Rossini. Right. Alessandro Manzoni, not so much, but I think it's interesting that Verdi said, if anybody remembers this requiem, it's going to be because of Alessandro Manzoni. Do you, does anyone here know who Alessandro Manzoni is? In any case, it's ended up being one of the most popular requiems, perhaps after Mozart, the second most popular. Do you have any idea what about it is so popular with audiences? It's even in popular culture, you hear the DSRA especially used. Any ideas? Just that it's really well written. It, 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 it appeals, this work and the the Brahms Requiem are almost bookends in some ways. You have the great introspection of the German Requiem that makes one really look inside. And again, Brahms was uh, about as irreligious as they came, but he understood what he wanted to do with life itself and make his mark. With this work, it, it's just so well written. Every moment of this piece is completely engaging. As you said, it was originally, he was, he composed one movement, I think it was the Liber Arme, uh, deliver me, the last movement. And he did that because of um, the death of Rossini. Uh, there was a project, kind of a failed project, of having six or seven of the greatest composers of the day write a requiem mass for the death of Rossini. And this was Verdi's contribution. Never got off the ground for a variety of reasons which really don't matter. But a few years later, Verdi said, I've really got to revisit this. And he used very generously of his Liberame, the um, last movement, and then wrote the rest of the piece. The last movement's not the longest by any stretch. I can tell you that the Dies Irae, with all of its various components, is the second movement, is the large part of the work. It's the bulk of it. And several of the movements subsequent are much shorter movements. But um, that being said, 
it's the power and the drama. It, it really is drama. It's opera writ large. You mentioned the Brahms Requiem a couple of times, and it's, it's the Requiem that often comes up as a piece that is contrasted with the Verdi mm -hmm. Requiem. Um, one of the obvious things the two have in common is that they were both writing a mass for the dead, but both of them were not terribly religious composers or, or terribly religious people. Do you see other parallels between these two? You referred to them as bookends. What do they have in common? How are they alike? And Brahms, by the way, loved the Verdi Requiem also. Mm -hmm. You know, in very many ways, they, they came from not dissimilar childhoods. Um, Verdi came from absolute poverty. Brahms came from um, very close to the bottom of the social um, uh, ladder himself, very poor. Uh, they both had to work terrifically hard as composers. They did work hard. Um, I don't know if Verdi did the same as Brahms. Brahms, when he turned 30, looked back on all the things that he'd written to the age of 30 and one night made an enormous fire. Very little survives. So the best of Brahms is there. Heaven knows how many pieces would have actually been tremendous works. That said, the, the Brahms contrasts in that it is a much more introspective work um, than the Verdi, uh, which has moments of extreme introspection but has much more power and grandeur. Mm. Yet they were written within five, actually the Libera May and the uh, Eine Deutsche Requiem were done in the same year, 1869. And um, uh, the completed um, Verdi Requiem was done in 1874, by 1874. So they were extreme contemporaries. I think it was temperament, I think it was, um, somewhat a difference of um, the nationalistic tendency. Brahms was not as nationalistic uh, in the sense that Verdi was and knowing his place there. And um, the differences in the um, liturgical uh, material because of Lutheranism. Wrapping up, just a, a few more minutes, because you're not the person that uh, one of us, the old classical hosts, often get to talk with, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? I know you've been with the orchestra since 1982. You've been featured as a soloist on, I believe, the, the Strauss um, Horn Concerto and the Mozart Horn Concerto. But for folks who have not seen you front and center talking, can you tell us about your background? Oh, I was born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, lived in... <laughs> no, absolutely not, but you can watch me throw that silver dollar. Um, no, I actually was born in Indiana and only about 60, 70 miles away from Abe Lincoln's um, uh, home as a child when he was moved to Indiana. Um, I escaped, <laughs> and uh, it, which was a good thing to do as uh, uh, the running joke is that Indiana is a good place to be from. <laughs> but uh, no, I started off, uh, somehow or another, I got f pushed into music. Uh, by uh, my um, 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 public school music teacher. And uh, she introduced me to some uh, people that decided they were gonna do a Pygmalion kind of thing and see if they could actually teach this fellow how to play French horn and how to raise himself up. And in many ways, uh, I was a science project for a couple of guys that didn't have a lot else to do. <laughs> And it's it, it, using Hillary's words, it took a village. <laughs> and they used almost everybody. <laughs> but I ended, up, um, I ended up in music, and um, it's been a wonderful life. I have been able to do some absolutely tremendous things, meet tremendous people, shake hands with people that you know, I, I never would have dreamed mm -hmm. possible, and make a pretty good career out of it here. John Cox, Principal Horn of Our Oregon Symphony, thank you so much. The Verity Requiem is coming up.
7.30, just about a half an hour from now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us a little bit early tonight.